Coming up, it's back to school time. We're visiting with an elementary school teacher about how to support Indigenous students. And fresh off his first reality TV challenge, Frank Buffalo Hyde is ready to talk about Native Americana. Plus, we travel east to the land of the people of the dawn and check in on the annual Passamaquoddy Day celebration. I am Alia Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 Indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of Indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class Indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. Thank you for joining us. We start today in Utah where tribal leaders are celebrating a legal win to protect their sacred land. In 2021, President Joe Biden reaffirmed the original boundaries of two national monuments at Bears Ears and the Grand Staircase Escalante. The boundaries of these monuments had been previously downsized under former President Donald Trump's administration. That posed a threat to the land through vandalism as well as mining and logging. The state of Utah challenged the expanded boundaries, saying the Biden administration interpreted the Antiquities Act in an overly broad manner. Earlier this month, a U.S. District Court judge dismissed that lawsuit. Several tribes, including the Hopi, Navajo, Ute Mountain Ute, and Zuni Pueblo, intervened in the lawsuits by the state. Even though the judge dismissed the case, this legal fight is far from over. Already, the state of Utah has filed an appeal in the Tenth Circuit Court. Governor Spencer Cox told the Salt Lake Tribune his state is prepared to appeal the case all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court if necessary. Maine Governor Janet Mills this year vetoed a bill that would have granted tribes greater sovereignty. The move was a setback for the state's indigenous citizens, but at least one tribal leader is finding optimism. Here's ICT's Stuart Huntington with more. Maine's four native nations have a different legal standing than other federally recognized tribes after trading away certain rights under the Maine Indian Claims Settlement Act of 1980. Tribal leaders have long sought changes to the act, and this year's bill would have allowed more federal laws to apply to tribes and make them eligible for more federal funding. Passamaquoddy Chief Renee Newell told ICT tribes have broad backing among lawmakers, but the governor's mansion remains a hurdle. I believe that we've had the support from both sides of the house, uh, in the chambers, the Senate side, as well as the house. I think the resistance to fully support um, the tribes comes directly from the chief executive's office. Newell noted a veto override effort in the state's house failed by only four votes and says a separate bill that would grant even greater sovereignty to the tribes was held over and will be taken up again next year. The results of the veto shows that there's more work to be done. Still, she says the formation of the Wabanaki Alliance just a few years ago to present a unified front and voice in Maine politics is bearing fruit. I think the last five years have truly shown that the tribes can come together and work together and present our issues together and find re resolution together. In Sabayak, Maine, Stuart Huntington, ICT News. 
Over 60 judges and experts determined the top winners of the Santa Fe Indian Market that took place over the weekend. The announcement of the Best of Show, Best of Class and Special Award winners was made public at the Best of Show ceremony last Friday afternoon. This year's Best of Show went to Jennifer Tafoya from Santa Clara Pueblo for her etched black pot made from hand-dug clay and natural paint. Lyndon Sosi from the Navajo Nation took best jewelry piece with this turtle made from sterling silver, coral, turquoise, lapis, and boulder opal. Pawnee and Cherokee artist Dan Horschief was among the painting, drawing, graphics, and photography class with this painting called Judgment Day Manifest, the Greasy Grass 1976 Keo Stand. For beadwork and quill work, Jackie Larson bred one for their beaded Blackfeet horse mask made of wool, seed beads, brass beads and bells, wood, plexiglass and satin. For the full list of winners and more Santa Fe Indian Market coverage, check out ictnews.org. Heading to Colorado, a local college has started an initiative to revitalize native languages. Janine Fitzgerald and Fort Lewis College created the All Our Kin Collective this year to better connect students with their family, culture, and traditions. It was initiated through a $1.5 million grant through the Mellon Foundation, as well as support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Around 44% of the college's students are Native American. The college says 30 years ago, most of them could speak their language, but now that's not the case. The collective has created programs, a summer institution, and classes and certificates to help the students learn and share their languages. Students say they are eager to learn their language and traditions, adding the need has gone up since the pandemic due to many elders and language speakers passing away from COVID. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Around the U.S., children are dusting off their backpacks and getting excited for the start of a new academic year. Last year, we aired a back-to-school segment with my sister, Lorelai Chavez, who happens to be a teacher at the Santa Domingo Pueblo Elementary and Middle School in New Mexico. Many of you loved that segment, so we're doing it again this year. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lorelai Chavez. I am currently working at Santa Domingo School within Bernalillo Public Schools, and this year I'm teaching middle school social studies. You just started school. Tell us what you are observing in the behaviors of your students this year. So a lot of the things I'm seeing is I'm seeing excitement. I'm seeing excitement. I have kids coming. I've This is my third year I'm teaching them. So going from sixth grade to eighth grade, they're ready to be the seniors of the middle school. I see nervousness. I see kids who are nervous about taking off their masks for the first time. We're going back into full settings of school. And we do have a uh, availability for masks, but really feeling comfortable with their body and their faces that they haven't shown the world in three years. Um, and then another thing I'm seeing is a little bit of um, anxiousness as far as what friends am I going to make? Who's my new teacher? There are new students coming to my school. Maybe I'm going to a new school. And so I do see those little bits of anxiousness as our students are getting off the bus, heading to their classrooms. But I'm really excited and I'm ready to bring my positive behavior to um, counteract any anxiousness or nervousness that they may have. We know that confidence in kids and teens plays a huge role in their lives. What is something that parents can do in order to make their kids feel confident going back to school? The biggest thing I think parents can do is one, give your student positive affirmations. It's really important to remind them that they are the future of our generations, especially indigenous youth. Indigenous youth want to be known. They are loved. They are heard. They are cared for. So really waking up every day and saying, you're going to do a great job in school today. No matter how hard you try, your best is all we need for you to give today. Different types of positive affirmations to start their day off right. Um, other things you can do is continue those things throughout the year. Um, some kids take lunch boxes, but even putting positive notes 
um, having quotes or bringing educators into their life from your community. So any um, elders who've gone to college, but really bringing their voice um, into their students and reminding them that education is the catalyst for the future. Virtually everyone has a phone, especially elementary school kids, middle school kids, high school kids. What online safety tips do you look out for? So at our school, we are implementing our second year of no cell phone policy. So during the day, our students are checking their cell phone to their homeroom teacher. Throughout the day, they don't have access to their phone, and then they get it before they get back on the bus. Our biggest issue moving into that was parents were afraid um, with between school safety and COVID, our parents use those cell phones to make contact with their students at any time of the day. So really reassuring parents in your community that they still can have access to their student anytime during the day through the school office or through school personnel. Um, the second piece is really talking to your student about being a responsible cell phone owner really showing them what's appropriate cell phone time usage, what is not appropriate. And that may even lead to having more conversations within your family and with parents, as far as how do we set boundaries with technology and how do we have a good relationship with technology? Because as much as we don't want to admit it, technology is going to be a relative of ours and we have to practice kinship with technology. So just really being um, conscious of that and approaching it with that mindset. We know that lots of urban Native American kids are heading back to school. What message would you have for those students who might be a little nervous to walk into a classroom where they're the only Native student or they don't see Native teachers in their hallways? You do not have to hold the entire indigenous world on your shoulders. What you do is you bring your beautiful understandings, you bring your language, you bring whatever cap indigenous capacity you have to the school, and that's all you need to be. The hardest part within schools across the country is there's not enough teacher resources or training to teach maybe non-Native or teachers that have not taught Indigenous students before, how do you show up for Indigenous students? How to not offend? How to not celebrate things like the typical Thanksgiving narrative? And really honoring things like land back, land acknowledgement, um, current issues in Indigenous communities. Other things urban Native students can do is make connection to urban Indigenous communities. Um, all throughout America, our Indigenous peoples have been relocated, but we have found ways to connect in big cities and create spaces where we feel at home and feel connected. So not only can you seek those in your big cities or the urban areas that you live, but you can also recreate those spaces within your school. So starting a Native American club, starting any type of Indigenous um programming or initiatives at your school is something you can take on that will not only help you, but maybe help out another Indigenous students that didn't know or maybe needed the same kind of help that you do. Last year, I asked you if you had a message for your fellow Indigenous educators. So I'll ask you the same thing again this year. I want to first start with honoring yourself, your mind, your body, and your soul. As Indigenous educators, we show up every day and we give our entire energy, our love, our grace to all our students. And the hardest part is really taking that moment or taking that time to pour back into yourself. So whether it's you're taking five minutes to go feel the rays of the sun on your body, or you go outside and you take a deep breath of Mother Earth's air, and that's what sustains you or gives you a little bit of peace and healing to keep you going through your day. Doing things on the weekend to help you feel better and feel ready to go back each week and be the best teacher that we can be for our students. Um, and I say that because I know in our schools, uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about student SEL, but we don't spend a lot of time on teacher SEL. And so it is hard, but we do have to take that capacity in our hands and try our best to do the things that we can do so that we can show up and be those amazing, influential, important Indigenous teachers that are in our schools 
across the nation and across the world. Well, my beautiful sister, I am so proud of you, and I hope that you have the very best school year. Thank you so much for taking the time to join the ICT Newscast today. I appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. And back to school, teachers. Have a great year. Let's go east now to Wabanaki territory where ancient traditions are growing strong again. And nowhere is that more visible than at the Passamaquoddy Days celebration on the Passamaquoddy Reservation. For nearly six decades, the people of the dawn have used the growing event as an annual touchstone for their culture and life ways. ICT's Stuart Huntington visited last week and has this report. Tribal citizens and non-tribal citizens gathered along the Passamaquoddy Nation shore for drums, dances, and smiles. But the day also had deep meaning. It's very significant to our people because um, we're handing down songs, stories, and ceremonies, uh, and we're passing it on from one generation to the other. That was Dwayne Toma, who, as director of the Passamaquoddy Tribal Museum in Zabayak, is dedicated to preserving, nourishing, and rejuvenating his nation's culture. It's real important for us to gather, to come together, and to be able to um, uh, unite our people and all people. So we invite everyone to come to celebrate with us, to share some of the songs, the stories. Uh, so it's really an opportunity for us to uh, build relationships with one another. And also, says Alberta Newell, to reconnect. It's, it's to heal and to commune with the ancestors and pray for goodness for our families and our friends and our community. It gives us time to family, friends, people we haven't seen all year that come together, especially COVID, um, that can come together and we can just reconnect and meet all the new babies and meet all the new spouses or um, even grief for those who have passed on. So it, to me, it's all about family. The whole past 40 days is about family. being with friends and having good thoughts and eating and dancing and singing and drumming and just being with everybody. That, that's what I find important. The celebration has grown over the years and now kicks off with an overnight ancestors paddle canoe journey from the nation's northern territory at Indian Township down to its seaside lands in Zabayak. It's a special time, says Passamaquoddy Chief Renee Newell. It's a spiritual journey, certainly. I think we have to be mindful of the, the history and the significance of that paddle. And we have connections to our ancestors. And this particular paddle brought blessings along the way in being able to see 14 eagles join us along the route. The paddle is also a way to reconnect with and revitalize ancient and sturdy traditions, says organizer Kyle Lolar. It's just part of who I am and what my culture is. As a Penobscot tribal citizen, I, I'm on the water ever since I was a little kid. Um, birch bark canoes, warrior canoes, kayaks, you name it, we're always on the river and that's just part of who we are. Before colonization, we had, this was our highways. The waterways were our highways. Anywhere you went, there was a birch bark canoe ready to go. And you had language keepers, you had knowledge keepers keeping us alive and running from point to point on the rivers, on the lakes, on the oceans. Um, so that's why it's so important that we get these going again so that the nations are then communicating with each other again, getting to know each other, getting the elders to share knowledge that has been sleeping for a while. And um, myself and others, it's our responsibility to bring that back out and do the work and restore the reach of the people of the Dawnland. Actually, that's Canada right there, and this actually this bay is named uh, the Passamaquoddy Bay. Um, so we have a deep uh, relationship and a connection um, uh, to the ocean. So uh, the water is very sacred to our people. 
according to us, um, it's been handed down since time immemorial that, you know, that is Passamaquoddy territory. Um, so that political border, uh, and that's exactly what it is, it's a political border. Uh, so we don't recognize that political border. Um, we have to deal with it all the time. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just an ongoing process to be able to, um, you know, work with these officials uh, regarding the border. This is our 57th year of uh, hosting uh, Passamaquoddy Days, which has really turned into a weekend event. And for me, it's about welcoming people here to Sabayak and seeing our family, you know, come home to visit and welcoming new people to the community to to learn about our culture, you know, to share in our traditions. In Zabayak, Maine, in Passamaquoddy Territory, Stuart Huntington, ICT News. Onondaga citizen and painter Frank Buffalo Hyde had an incredible year. Not only does he have a new exhibition in the town he grew up in, Frank just finished a reality TV show called The Exhibit. He joins us now virtually with more on his reality challenge and his newest showings of art. Welcome back, Frank. Hi, thanks for having me. It's great to be back. So the MTV series that you were on, the exhibit, tell us about what made you want to be in the show. Well, you know, one of the very unique aspects of that uh, show was that the um, participants were curated. And uh, by that, I mean, they were selected over, um, you know, the curators got together and surveyed um, artists from all over the world, all over the country. And, um, took a look at their portfolios and by the strength of their work, um, contacted each artist and, and sort of that's how the ball got started rolling. For our viewers who are hearing about this show for the first time at a high level, tell us what some of the goals are. Well, the um, I think the exhibit was um, a partnership with MTV and the Smithsonian Channel and, and their sort of uh, uh, goal was to focus more on the process of each artist. And so you got to spend more time with each artist, with each commission, uh, rather than having like a frenetic um, elimination. So what's also unique about the show is that um, all of the people participating, the artists um, that were on the show were in every episode, um, except for like half of the last one. I could imagine that competing against so many artists could be really difficult. What was the most challenging part of it for you? Honestly, for me, the the hardest part was um, being away from my family uh, for that amount of time to shoot. Um, but also, there was they, it, it took the studio a while to get a handle on the, the temperature inside of the stu inside of the the studio where we were working. So for like the first couple of days, it was it was like super hot. So I don't know if you've seen the show or, or you watch the show, you'll see a few episodes where everybody's kind of uh, uh, svitzy. <laughs> so I know that you didn't make it all the way to the end, but can you talk about what you learned from your time on this reality series? You know, for me, the uh, the experience uh, before we started and, and why I agreed to it is because representation is very important. Some people will argue with me on that, but, you know, seeing, uh, having people out in Indian country be able to take a look at the TV and see someone that looks like them, um, is important. I mean, it just takes that one little spark to get somebody, you know, to identify with a career or to, to know that they can, you know, uh, pursue something as a career that maybe not was available to them. So representation was definitely um, the most important thing for me. And then also uh, it was an opportunity to um, post pandemic to say yes to more things in life. Um, you know, I don't think we've, we've really dealt with all the trauma that we felt during the pandemic. So it was, it was important for me to get out there and start experiencing and saying yes to some opportunities I might not have done beforehand. I want to switch gears a bit because you have a new exhibition called Native Americana and it's showing at the Everson Museum. Give us an overview of the whole show. Yeah, at the, uh, the Everson Museum in Syracuse, New York, and Syracuse is six miles away from my reservation. Shout out to the Onondaga Nation, South End. Um, 
and Native Americana is a the culmination of my over 25 years of work where I'm investigating the conversation between popular culture and indigenous knowledge. And um, I think you'll, you'll be surprised that for me in this exhibition, there's a lot of um, mixed media installations and interactive things that, you know, I might not have had the space to do before. And uh, to his credit, the curator Garth Johnson at the Everson, he never told me no, like every crazy idea I had, I, uh, he said, yeah, we'll figure out a way to do it. So yeah, I, I consider it my best show to date. We know that a lot of your work fuses pop images with your native background. Can you tell us more about why braiding this imagery is, in, is part of the art that you're making? Well, I, you know, I, I, I use popular images um, for a reason. I think it's because everybody has a built-in narrative already. And it's kind of like a shorthand to let people into the paintings and the work. So, you know, it kind of disarmed them at a certain level, like, you know, they recognize an image and like, oh, yeah, I, you know, I know what that is, or I get that, or I remember seeing this, or I felt this way when I saw this image. And then once that engagement happens, it allows me to sort of um, have them explore my content or the intent behind my work. Well, Frank Buffalo Hyde, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.